mom, here I am. <laughs> okay. I don't know why I'm having so much problems today. That's okay. Uh, uh, shoot. Okay. Um, here you go. I'm going to spotlight you. Oh, you're spotlighted. And then I'm going to find Andy. And uh, yeah, where are you? Oh, there he is. Okay. Okay. So you're both spotlighted and I'll take the spotlight off of Rebecca uh, when you're done introducing Andy. Okay. And I ask everybody else in the audience to please mute yourself if you are not muted. We don't want the background noise. Um, Andy and Rebecca can stay unmuted. And, um, and then we'll have room for comments uh, afterwards when after Andy is done. So Rebecca, take it away. Okay. It gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, one of the men I consider a truly great artist that has greatly influenced me in my lifetime. I've known Andy since the early 2000s and did a little bit of work at the drawing studio with him. So um, let me just give you a little bit about his background and then I'll let him take it away. Andrew Rush was educated at the University of Illinois where he studied design and printmaking, got his BFA in 1953 and at the University of Iowa, his MFA in 1958 and later as a Fulbright scholar to Italy. He taught at the University of Arizona, associate professor of art from 1959 to 1970 and continues as the resident of the Rancho Linda Vista art community in Oracle, Arizona, which was established in 1968. In 1992, supported by a core group of Tucson artists, he founded the drawing studio and it's been going and is still going strong. His work has been included in many national exhibitions especially of prints and drawings. He has been active as a book illustrator and public artist from 1981 on. Rush began to take an interest in tile and relief sculpture for architectural applications. In 2003, he was nominated for the Arizona Governor's Arts Award, both as an artist and art educator, and was given a retrospective exhibition of his intaglio printmaking at the University of Arizona Museum of Art. In 2006, he received the Tucson Pima Arts Council's Lifetime Achievement Award. In 2010, the state of Arizona gave its Community Governor's Arts Award to the Drawing Studio for its innovative contributions to the community. And besides all this cool, great stuff, I will just say, he is one of the most inspiring, amazing mentors I have seen who continues to remake himself constantly. Take it away, Andy. Okay, Rebecca, many, many thanks. Mm -hmm. It's wonderful that, uh, to be talked about by a good friend like you. It's mm -hmm. great. So hi, everybody. <clears throat> um, I'm going to uh, uh, talk to you today uh, uh, on a subject that I... Uh, think it's valuable to us all as artists. But uh, first of all, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, the drawing studio was, uh, it has evolved with uh, my understanding that uh, that goes back a long way that, uh, that I think that, that the creative study of visual intelligence and the visual languages of the world uh, has been completely ignored by the linear universe linear systems of our uh, of our education. Uh, it's amazing that if you think about how um, uh, when I came to when I came to Tucson in uh, I, what was it in uh, 1959 um, I looked up how many arts organizations there were and I could find 11 phone numbers which included galleries, uh, a symphony orchestra, uh, the University of Arizona Art Department, but there wasn't much and uh, uh, as you have, may have noticed that over the last 50 years, uh, the way we communicate with each other around the world has shifted from basically a reading, writing, and arithmetic linear uh, language-based uh, communication to visual-based communication. Because now 
We are the internet, we are the movies, we are magazines, we are the uh, computer. Uh, anybody with a computer and a little interest can publish a book without having to have a, a, a commercial publisher. Uh, and the book can be as much about images as it is about anything else. So uh, uh, th this is an amazing world we're living in, don't you think? Yes. Uh, in, in, and and the, the natural interest in, in uh, uh, learning more about visual, uh, visual language to me uh, is how come the drawing studio is still here to almost completely by word of mouth. Uh, uh, because there is a, a natural inclination, I think, among us all to, mo to more deeply involve ourselves in, uh, in, the, uh, in the creative uh, 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 direction of life. Uh, that's not something that was around here uh, uh, much for people who were basically working for a living, raising children, uh, 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 working sometimes two or three jobs. Uh, 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 so that, and, and even now, one of the issues we're finding at the drawing studio is uh, most of our most of our clientele are first of all a women, and b uh, uh, people who are middle age or older, except for the very a wonderful and large children's program that we manage, uh, so that there's a there's a uh, uh, a need right now. I'm we're discovering uh, to uh, actively uh, take and introduce uh, the entire community, including especially people who of low income or uh, 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 in, in terms of since the murder of George Floyd, the the relationship of people who've not had the opportunity. Of, of a leisure class uh, aspect of the culture to uh, take an interest in, uh, in themselves as a creator. Mostly we're working and raising kids and trying to keep things going. So uh, uh, the drawing studio is now really concentrating on the uh, issues of, uh, of bringing, bringing a creative understanding to, uh, to everybody. Uh, so uh, just, just for your interest, uh, we now have a, a scholarship program founded by a number of patrons that is for adults from anywhere. Uh, anybody who is, uh, is, is black in, in, uh, in, uh, in Tucson is welcome to uh, a scholarship uh, because we're, we, we now have a fund that we can uh, do, that, do that with. So we're, we're, we're learning how to reach out more deeply into the culture. And I mentioned that to you guys because I want your help. I want you to be uh, to to uh, to help us promote that we're available uh, to anybody who's ready to learn something about how uh, visual languages work. As you guys, some of you know, we have a fundamentals program that's uh, that's uh, basically uh, for anybody who's just starting out, wherever they are in life, whether they're nine years old or ninety, and whether they've had any art in their background or not. Uh, so uh, anyhow, that, that's, that's enough about all that. I just want your help in, in helping us bring who we are and what we do to as many people as you know who would, who would, uh, who would enjoy and benefit from it. Um, so the other thing, being, uh, by the way, I have great admiration for the Paperworks organization and for the work I've seen come from artists involved with it. Uh, but also the, the kind of ongoing ability to take care of each other and to give each other venues and, uh, and uh, conversations and uh, uh, along the way to, to uh, I just think it's wonderful what you do. Okay, um, so I may need a little help here. I want to put up on the, on the uh, board a, uh, okay, how do we do it? Okay, can you all see this? Yes. Thank you, okay. Um, some years ago, I became friends with a marvelous uh, anthropologist uh, and, and teacher called Edward Hall. Um, his books, in fact, when I was a young art uh, teacher at the university many years ago, uh, were known to me and I actually used two of them a book called Beyond Culture and a book called The Hidden Dimension as textbooks for my art students. Um, uh, because I found that his understanding of, uh, of, the, of, of the act called seeing uh, was influenced by the fact that his, uh, his young, uh, Edward Hall's young life was working with the WPA 
uh, particularly with Navajo uh, uh, people uh, uh, in the uh, WPA uh, work of, of building uh, uh, walls and bridges and uh, 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 projects uh, throughout the throughout the Southwest uh, as part of the uh, as part of the financial program of the WPA. And so he was hired because he found that he was the only one who could understand how Navajos work and didn't work, that they were not eight to five uh, uh, American white industrial laborers. They worked with a, with a whole different idea of what work is. And so uh, uh, throughout, his, throughout his life, Ed Hall, uh, for example, he was hired by the UN uh, to uh, help uh, the, the, uh, the uh, uh, UN understand how you have to talk differently into different cultures, depending upon what languages were available. So for example, when he, he found that when you were talking with anybody from the Arab countries, you need to be in rooms that had very high ceilings because they got very claustrophobic because they were in the kind of normal corporate room with an eight or nine foot ceiling. Uh, uh, they, just, they just can't think. Uh, or he found that, for example, uh, when you're talking with Italians, if the conversations don't end with a hug, you've got no deal, because uh, uh, the, the the Italian culture has a, a much more kind of a hands-on tact tactile way of expressing ourselves uh, in uh, in with, with our with our uh, with our body language. Or, for example, if you were uh, sitting around with uh, a bunch of Englishmen in a in a, in a business meeting, if you had the chairs closer than uh, four feet, uh, or, or rather six, six to seven feet, everybody got very uncomfortable. The English businessmen don't like to be too close. So all kind. So he did a book, a, a lot of studies with it, like how people stand in line in Germany when they go to go to get on the bus, but they do not do that in Spain, where you just crowd your way to the front and get there if you can. So I, I, I listened to Ed Hall completely. And one of the things we talked about at length was how many places there are in our brain that is involved with the act that we call seeing. You know, uh, we, you know we think we see life like how it is. Uh, but if you've been an artist for a while, then you know that that's nonsense, that we see from a cultural uh, mindset that uh, is one that we have grown up with, and uh, and it and it uh, it relates directly to uh, what our uh, tribal uh, patterns are for what's important. So, like if I were a if I were a Maasai cattle herder uh, uh, with my thirty brown cows, uh, and I and Andy and I'm driving I'm driving by or riding by on a train, looking out on this on this cattle herder with his cows. Uh, I see a guy with his cows, but what he sees is uh, who's sick and who's well, uh, whose who's calf is, is, a, is the baby of which cow, uh, who's young and who's old, uh, and so forth. So it, it, this is his family and his, his, uh, his relationship to his 30 cows is personal, like your, your relationship is personal with your daughter or your son or your cousin or your nephew. Uh, but if you took a Maasai tribesman and, uh, and uh, somehow uh, uh, got him to Los Angeles uh, and put him on the freeway, he would be dead in 15 minutes because he has no seeing that has to do with the traffic we put up with, uh, with our cars and our cities. Uh, so in the same way, if you look at your family, uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, as when we're children, we're told a lot of things. Uh, and, and for a child, they're all even. For example, if your mom says to you, uh, 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 this is a picture of your grandmother. Uh, she's uh, 70 years old now and she has gray hair. And uh, don't you ever talk to your sister that way again or I'll spank you. Or uh, this is a, a pencil, it has an eraser on the end. Uh, but don't you ever uh, uh, leave your spinach on the plate or hide it under the table. Uh, or I won't feed you anymore. So there's a, the child is getting all these messages, some of which are valuable and, uh, and, and useful facticity, and others are uh, value-laden uh, 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 
that that uh, is just is just what the uh, parent thinks the child uh, needs to learn and needs to know. So uh, uh, those of you who are artists, one of the things I know about you is that you took a choice somewhere to dig yourself out from underneath the uh, kind of family laden idea of what vision is. And as you know, if you study drawing or study uh, have studied with any really good art teacher, you know that there are moments when if you're looking to draw things, quote, as we say, as they are, you're up against uh, 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 the conflict between what you think about something and then what you see actually when you begin to take it apart as an artist. Uh, and so there's a constant awakening uh, in, in the learning to, to draw uh, that there's a world that does not necessarily match how you were, how you were brought up to see the world. So uh, this little talk I've got here for you guys today is, uh, uh, is, is uh, rooted in my conversations with Ed Hall. Um, and uh, we selected three, uh, in other words, when we do something, something we call seeing something, uh, we're, we're, basically, uh, uh, we're basically discussing uh, 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 a, a world outside ourselves. In other words, if you, if you, uh, if, if you, uh, you know, when we see something, we're seeing two things. We're seeing from our skin outward, that is something, something in the world that is not us. But secondly, we're bringing to that seeing the out, out there, not us world, we're bringing uh, the other times we've seen other things or that thing, or uh, how we see in the first place, because we're a, we're a cattle driver from Tanzania, or we're the child of uh, Mary Smith from uh, Topeka, Kansas. Uh, so we're seeing a world that's, that's uh, already in place, as it were, from the inside. So all seeing combines, combines what you're looking at with what you've already uh, uh, digested in some way in your visual life. Uh, but what Ed and, and I realize is that there are seven different centers in the brain that are active. That now that we can kind of measure things uh, uh, as, uh, with, with uh, the science we have nowadays, uh, when, when you call see something, there's seven different parts of our brain that light up. Uh, which tells us that seeing is not just one act, it's a, it's a complex thing going on. Uh, and out of those, uh, uh, I've found three that are the most useful to talk about in uh, waking, waking up uh, uh, our, our skill as artists. And so those are what I'm gonna talk about today. So um, here we go. No, wait a minute, wait a minute. I may not be able to do this. Um, so um, the first of the three things, the first one is uh, I call reptilian. Um, and it's the most primitive part of the brain um, because it has to do with issues of our survival. Uh, and so shape of the shape of things and the patterns of various shapes uh, provide the first uh, recognition of order that, uh, uh, that, that uh, is involved in seeing. And what's valuable to know if you're as an artist is that uh, uh, is that your brain is all is 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 on 24/7 sorting pattern like rate like a radar that is never off. That's because you survive by your ability to read pattern unconsciously quickly, uh, and so that you know tiger leave now, uh, uh, edgy sharp don't touch soft. Uh, 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 capable of touching uh, and so forth, so that we're constantly sorting. And, and by the way, animals or our mammals do this as well. Uh, we're constantly sorting the patterns of uh, uh, before our eyes for information about that we need in order to be sure we're taken care of. So there's that's going on all the time. And if you're an artist and you don't know that that everybody, whether they're an artist or not, or whether they they know anything about uh, about uh, art, uh, is doing that. So that uh, what I notice often is that artists who think they're drawing a picture of their dog, and uh, don't understand why nobody's very interested in it, don't understand that the uh, the the role of pattern is already well developed in anybody looking at anything you make. Uh, so if you if you if you're not aware that you're pattern 
of your of your artwork is the first thing that other people see, uh, then you're often in your own way. Uh, because if you are unconsciously in, involving patterns that that drive people away, like too much sharpness, for example, and so forth, uh, that you often are in your own way so that you really are, are not in control of how people look at your work. So like when I'm talking with my students, one of the things I tell them is, uh, if, if you got a piece hanging on the wall of a show and it's, a, and it's a, like 100 feet away from you when you walk in the door, uh, if the pattern that, that, you, uh, uh, that one sees from 100 feet away uh, is, is, is interesting on some level, then you'll attract your, your observer uh, to look more closely and more closely yet. But if you are not aware of the role of pattern in your own work and, the, and, and its role in communicating maybe on the most reptilian or essential primitive level, uh, then, uh, then you, you've got an aspect that's in your own way until you wake up to it. Uh, so for example, I have at the drawing studio, a course I do from time to time called cut paper. And in that course, I only allow people to work with uh, black and white paper, scissors and glue. And the, the point being is that when you begin to uh, actually uh, take responsibility for the patterns that you make in your art, uh, that you begin to have a sense of, its, of, its, of, of a way to incorporate it, that it serves the purposes you have in making that image. Uh, so, uh, so I found that uh, you know, three or four weeks of just working with a cut paper and pattern and looking at what patterns you come up with and why you come up with those and not others is really valuable and a lot of fun as well. And I know everybody who's ever taken that little course I do uh, speaks about, about it months and years later as being really valuable in their own work. So pattern, and so in this particular image, uh, by the way, what you're looking at here is a tile mural I did about uh, 20 years ago. Uh, it's been long, it was in a show somewhere in Dallas and somebody bought it. I have no idea where it is. Uh, it's about four and something feet wide. It's about uh, two, three inches high or so. And the squares that are in this image you're looking at are the same size of the squares that are in your bathroom. These are, these are done on four and a quarter uh, standard commercial American tile. And so as you can see, I've used the rectangle of the tile or the, the, the square uh, rectangle of the tile and then the, the subject of uh, the rectangles. This is an essay in, in a pattern of rectangles, as you can see. I've got little notes around here, like this rectangle in the upper left uh, where, where I use the uh, where I use the uh, blinds of, in in the little room I'm in, are the are the pattern of the white square in the middle, which basically refers to a window in which we're looking outside, or uh, even the uh, parallelogram of the table. Uh, uh, are, those are all uh, a kind of a, to create a a combination of shapes that tell a story as a pattern. So pattern is the repetition of, of the elements of shape. And the repetition provides a vocabulary and an element of safety uh, to human beings that allows us to kind of relax and take in everything else. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, a, a good, uh, a good uh, example of this is if you're flying uh, in an airplane at 33,000 feet and you're looking down on the ground, you can tell where human beings have been because wherever there are patterns that have to do with Greek geometry, circles, squares, rectangles, and so forth, uh, that then you know human beings have been there because nature doesn't do that. Nature has other patterns, but they don't have, they don't have geometric patterns. So geometric patterns tell us people have been here. And that's why you know, the, the picture that you make is really rooted in the book, which was, uh, 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 and then eventually uh, into murals, as uh, because in uh, in, the, in at least in Western Europe uh, uh, there was no literacy on any wide level until the Industrial Revolution in the 18th, late eighteenth century, so that uh, 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 pictures were on the walls of churches in murals and stained glass uh, as a way for the uh, for the, uh, the the clergy to uh, tell the stories of that particular religion in, in a way that people could understand since they couldn't read. So, uh, so the role of the book, pattern, square, shape, rectangle, 
uh, uh, goes into architecture, goes into the houses we live in. Uh, and uh, uh, I have uh, had the great privilege uh, some few years ago to travel with a friend to Ecuador and live in the rainforest with the, with the Achuar uh, rainforest people for a couple of weeks. And they have no patterns. They have no boxes. They have no Safeway stores. They have no, uh, uh, no trash. Uh, they, build, they build their uh, houses out of thatched roofs, which are circular because they're built on a single pole. Uh, they have no walls because the, uh, the thatched uh, circle is held up by uh, poles onto a little four, three or four foot high uh, wall that everybody sits on because they don't have any furniture. Uh, the men uh, in, in the Achuar world have a, each family has a tradition of uh, lace work that holds up the thatched roof. And each, each lace work pattern is incredibly complicated, beautiful uh, design that, uh, that is just wonderful to look at when you look up in any of the houses. And, and depending on what family you're in, each of those patterns is different. So, uh, so uh, uh, the ge geometric pattern belongs solely to our, uh, to our particular Western way of thinking about uh, shape that comes out of, out of uh, the Greek culture. Uh, so the, the second thing is called the cortical part of the brain. And the cortical part of the brain uh, uses systems like logic, perspective, and in particularly narrative and scale like large and small and kinds of subject matter which we're already familiar with. So that uh, uh, in order to uh, uh, be, be mostly when people think of making pictures, they're thinking of uh, telling a story that is a, 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 you know, this is my dog or this is my mother or this is the inside of my house or this is a plant. Uh, or this is a, uh, you know, especially narrative, uh, which was uh, used heavily in religion to, uh, to uh, describe the religion, uh, not, not, only, uh, not only Christianity, but uh, Judaism and Buddhism and uh, uh, many, of the, uh, 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 many of the other ways of thinking about spiritual life uh, have long used uh, 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 stories which are uh, in pictures. And the third thing uh, is we call limbic. Uh, and it's a, it's a particular part of the brain. And the limbic center of seeing is, is uh, uh, involved with emotion, feeling, mood, uh, what things feel like, tactility, intimacy. So again, uh, in the image, I, I, as you notice, I've left this same one up here at this so far. Uh, the image I'm showing you the, the, uh, the limbic part of this image is the warm colors, maybe, uh, the relationship of the dark interior to the light outside, uh, the familiar objects of a household table set for a meal, uh, the feeling of safety and familiarity, all of those are limbic aspects of the image you're looking at. So th this, uh, before we move on, is just meant to represent uh, that in most of the images you make, if you have uh, an understanding and, and uh, experience and practice in, uh, in your work uh, and, and uh, an intention to, to uh, communicate clearly to whoever is looking at what you make uh, and you're, and you're uh, very familiar with the uh, limbic aspects of your work, with the, with the storytelling aspects of your work uh, and with the uh, primitive shape, pattern, color, uh, aspects that, that make your work uh, interesting long after the subject is forgotten. If you're, in, if you're dealing with all of those when you work, then you're probably a pretty great artist. Uh, you're, uh, or you're, 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 on it, you're on it most of the time. So here, for example, uh, in a, in a, is an example where, although shape is not, is not just about, uh, uh, just about, uh, flat pattern, but it's the implied shape of the subject that you're working with. So here is a, I think the drawing is by a, a 16th century master called Guercino. And uh, the uh, silhouette uh, on the upper part is, uh, is, is, the, is what he's working with. Uh, so this is just to make it clear that shape is everywhere. 
even in things which in which the shape is of, of the things is not particularly the most important part. Or here, here's an Etruscan uh, wall painting. Um, and uh, this is long before perspective, right? There's no perspective here. Uh, so that if, where there's no perspective, there's no, you know, for the Etruscans, little meant unimportant. Big men important. Uh, uh, I have a, a, a storytelling of my uh, granddaughter who, uh, uh, when she was around seven or eight, she and I used to sit after dinner. She'd sit on my lap and we, we would uh, play, okay, you draw me one and I'll draw you one, uh, which was basically my, uh, uh, my way of uh, encouraging her to, to draw. So, uh, so she would say, uh, well, I want you to draw me, my boyfriend Patrick and me riding a motorcycle. So I'd make a little drawing of a motorcycle and the kids on the motorcycle, just, you know, like, like 30 second little line drawing. And she'd smile and yet nod and yes, and thank you. She said, that's great. And now I want you to draw mommy and daddy waving at us as we go by. So I drew a little hill and I drew a little house and I drew two little figures and I drew them waving. And Heather went quiet on me. So I said, Heather, so what's wrong with my picture? And she said, and this is a 20th, 20th century uh, a modern American child who reads photographs and goes to movies and so forth. But she says to me, why did you make them so small? Now, she's speaking, in other words, like an Egyptian. In, you know, in, uh, in the tomb paintings of Egypt, only the pharaoh is drawn large. If you draw the slaves of the pharaoh or the wives of the pharaoh, they're always smaller. So there's, so there's no... In, in this in this 20th century child or in Egyptians of 4000 BC, there is no language that says smaller means farther away. Now, visually speaking, smaller always is farther away, right? Uh, that is the eye, if something is farther away, it uses much less space in the, in the, in the, in the retina of the eye. So uh, uh, that's with the, with the company of photography, uh, that's become an almost, uh, uh, well, I'll talk more about that later, but, but it's become very normal to us. But here for an Etruscan, you can see if he wants to do trees, he's got to use the spaces between the figures because there's no other way to draw the trees. So as you can see, the trees are basically uh, ornamental. That is, you can't draw every leaf. So you draw a symbol of the tree, that is branches and a few leaves, and you use the space <laughs> because a, a picture for a Etruscan is like a tablecloth. It's not a window, like, a, like a, since the French Academy uh, and when perspective came into being. Uh, so this is looking at a, a flat tablecloth in which the tree has to use the space between the figures. And then let's look at the figures for a minute. Uh, the figure is not what people look like, is it? Uh, that is, if you look at the face, the face is in profile because that's the easiest way to see a face. The eye, however, in the face is full face. The eye is looking at us. Uh, so the eye is turned full face because the eye from the side is, is not easy to recognize. The nose, however, stays in profile. The ear is in full face. The shoulders are full face. You see both shoulders because there's no, you can't, one shoulder doesn't tell you you're not quite sure what you're dealing with. You also can see that the hands show all of the fingers and thumbs and, and are all shown wide open so that you can see all of, the, uh, all of the elements that tell you that's a hand. But if you look down at the feet, the feet are in profile. Again, for the same reason the nose is in profile because that's the best way you can see. A, and then if you go on to look at things like this, you'll see that the lips are full face and so forth. So in other words, it's a made up figure. It's made up. It's not, and, and, but it's typical of the uh, figure, figurative work of the uh, earliest parts of uh, picture making that we have in the Western world coming out of the Etruscan life, the Egyptian life, and later the Greeks. So it's an example of pattern using, uh, using the most typical point of view to tell us what we're looking at. Uh, this is a mosaic from Ravenna, and I just, it's a little later, of course, but it's still the, basically the same idea. If you look at the figures, 
the hands are open, as you can see, the eyes are full face. Uh, there's a little more uh, casualness because we're a little more sophisticated by this time, but still the basic symbols are just like, the, just like this, like the Etruscan one. So uh, let's go on here. And by the time we get to say the 14th or 15th century where we have printing being enveloped, uh, the first metal images uh, were like this one. Uh, th uh, they were basically engravings, um, uh, but they still used a profile because it was the still uh, one of the easiest ways to recognize uh, the face. Um, and they were still very uh, aware of pattern as being what keeps the eye interested. So the, uh, the uh, hairdress, uh, the uh, 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 jewelry, and so forth here are all uh, still uh, uh, made to make the picture very interesting. Uh, we'll talk a little more about why all that's still there as we go along. Uh, uh, I think this was made by a silversmith, by the way. Uh, where I think that uh, metal images came from was that silversmiths, it was too scary to send your, your actual silver or gold object to a client by public transport because of the, the uh, robberies were constant in those days. So uh, somebody figured out how to make a paste out of, uh, out of uh, olive oil and uh, candle soot. And so they rubbed it in their uh, relief uh, silver work and then uh, uh, put a piece of uh, cloth or, uh, or paper. Not, paper was hard come by in those days. Usually it was cloth. And that soaked up the, uh, the oil-based uh, uh, a replica of the silver image on the, uh, the made out of silver, and they could send that object uh, to a client without having to risk their uh, precious metal. And I think that's where uh, the first printmaking was was developed. It was actually from silversmith. And as an example, continuing with the notion of pattern and shape, here's a here's how most people learned the New Testament stories in the churches of Europe. Uh, who couldn't read and write uh, by giving them, first of all, a pattern, which was absolutely gorgeous. It's like uh, even us who don't keep up with this kind of storytelling of Christianity, uh, 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 love these mural, don't we? Don't we? I mean, they're so beautiful. Who cares what the story is? And so that's something that keep, to keep in mind in your own work. If your own work is absolutely beautiful, then uh, you can put whatever story in there you want and people will look at it. So the first thing is on the abstract level, that is pattern, shape, and color. Uh, uh, if, if that's interesting, everything else can flow from that. But if you don't take care of that, then it's, a, it's hard keeping people with you. So here, even in modern times, this is, this is Seurat, the great French impressionist, uh, using the same uh, principles that we saw in the Etruscan and in the Ravenna murals, uh, full face, frontal, sh only shape. The, uh, the original of this, by the way, is in color. So this is a black and white uh, image of it, uh, in which uh, Surat is re reconstructing and revisiting uh, uh, art that's 4,000 years old, uh, but now is called modern. And by the way, it's, it's the if, if ever anybody is telling you they're doing modern work, take a really good look at it because you're usually going to find that there's a uh, that there's a uh, history somewhere in the world of people who've been working this way for thousands of years. One of the examples I have, uh, I will bet that among you all, uh, there may be a few of you who know the name Charles Birchfield. Charles Birchfield. He was, he was given the first show of an American painter at the Museum of Modern Art by Alfred Barr when it first opened in the, in the, in the 40s uh, in this country. So uh, if you don't know who Charles Birchfield is, he's very well known among artists. But Charles Birchfield was a watercolorist. He was born and lived in Cleveland or, or near Cleveland. <coughs> And he didn't go to Europe until he was uh, uh, in his 50s. So uh, his watercolors are like nothing else. And one of the reasons not many people know about him was because he didn't work out of the conventional 
European style of composing landscapes and cityscapes like George, like John Singer Sargent did. Uh, he, his work is very abstract and very uh, 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 much ahead of his time, which is what Barr saw in his work. But why was that? Well, when he was 19 and finally convinced his father to let him go to art school, he was sent about 90 miles away to Cleveland where he enrolled in the Cleveland Institute of Art, which was associated with the Cleveland Museum. And uh, if any of you are from that part of the world, you know that the Cleveland Museum is one of the finest collections of Chinese painting in America. Uh, and as a 19 year old, Charles Birchfield got his first job uh, as a guard in the, in the Chinese painting wing of the Cleveland Museum where he stood, you know, how guards have to stand for, uh, you know, on those big heavy shoes all day long uh, in, in, in certain rooms. And so he got immersed in Chinese painting. And uh, once you know that about him and look at some of the collection of the Cleveland Museum of Art, then you know exactly where Charles Birchfield came from and what was, what was the art that most influenced him in, in his career. And then so-called modern art, right? Except that if you go back Aren't we, where, where is Picasso connecting with? So this is uh, one of the most marvelous pieces that he ever made, I think. Uh, it hangs in the Museum of Modern Art uh, in his permanent collection. Um, and if you take it apart here, you can see there is no perspective here. There is nothing but flat pattern, just like the Egyptians and the uh, Etruscans. Uh, and there are very, it's a very simple subject. He's, he's, He's got circles. Basically, it's a study in ovals and circles. Um, belly, breasts, face, and so forth. Mirror. Uh, and, uh, but as a profound painting, I think it's one of the most profound things I know in life. It deals with our inside life and our outside life. Uh, with, the, with the dark figure in the mirror and the light figure in the, on the left, and uh, uh, it, it basically uh, 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 tells the stories of fertility, uh, womanhood, uh, and, uh, and, and, and extremely modern in every sense. So this is, a, this is an artist who's well aware that shape, pattern, and color are what people see. The rest of it, you could add on to add to the, to add to the grace and and depth of the work, but uh, if you if you're if you're aware of pattern, color, and shape in your work as the first as your first level of communication, then uh, things go pretty well for you. Here's a piece I did years ago when I was doing the uh, covers for the uh, for an organization that produced program covers for the symphony and for the University of Arizona Artists Series. I had eight years when I discovered how to. Uh, how to have somebody holding one of these programs for the 20 minutes till the show started. So I, I got my art in front of a lot of people. But as you can see here, I'm using shape, color, and uh, the simplicity of marble, marble paper making uh, to, uh, to make this work with. Now let's turn to cortical scene. So cortical is the story. Uh, and this, I, I picked here a very a poor black and white reproduction of Leonardo da Vinci's Last Supper on purpose, because I wanted you to look at the uh, one point perspective, for example, look at the ceiling, the, the windows along the side, it's a little dark on the left, but they're clear on the right. Uh, the role of, uh, excuse me. The, the role of the, uh, oops, where did my, what happened? We see you. Oh, your computer isn't working. Oh, hold on. It, something. Okay, now we're back. I don't know what. I must have pressed the button. Okay. Okay. Are we all, all together again? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So uh, uh, you can see this is a, and people came from miles around to see this, uh, this mural. It was about maybe 25 feet wide. 
and it sits at the uh, when you walk up to it, uh, 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 you're you're walking up uh, in a room in which the perspective is in the room, and you're just kind of stepping into the window that's the picture in which the figure of Christ is the center point of the one point perspective, um, so that uh, uh, the idea of a, of a people being uh, uh, in a in a space uh, was uh, completely new to uh, uh, to to the uh, art, art observers of the time, and so this was this was like a, a phenomenon, like like we would sell tickets to uh, uh, to a visual phenomenon. I remember when my one of my children went to Disneyland when they were in school, and he came back and he said, "Dad, they have this movie theater that's in the round." And you hear this airplane and look behind you and you can see this plane coming on the screen behind you and then it goes overhead and you look up and there it is and then you look in the front and there it is going away from me. he said it's amazing. And I said to him, well, it sounds like reality to me, but okay, but that was that was the, uh, uh, the that was the phenomenon of one point perspective in Leonardo's time that was absolutely new to everybody. Uh, but. Uh, uh, Galileo, uh, 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 once he was interested in uh, planets, especially the moon, uh, he needed a way, then all of a sudden we needed a way to describe the, how, where things were in terms of far away or close by. Until there was any interest in astronomy, there was no perspective. So perspective is an invention of science to find a way to show things in space by using a, a very simple uh, 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 device uh, of, a, of a single point lens in, as in a camera or as in spectacles. And so uh, a friend of Galileo's happened to send him uh, a little telescope that was made in Germany for children and, and told him to look outside his, uh, his window uh, and uh, Galileo discovered that he could read the uh, writing on the church across the street and got very excited. And so within a short period of time, went to the island of Murano, which is, which is off the coast of Venice, Italy, which is a glass factory uh, uh, island and had the uh, lens makers there make him a, a couple of six inch lenses, which he had a spectacle maker polish and he made the first crude telescope. And that was where uh, Galileo began to study the moon with any great, uh, any great uh, practical interest. And uh, of course, that's what got him into trouble with the church because he eventually announced that the earth was not the center of the universe. Uh, and that of course was, was a big no-no in his time. But, but, but with, with that came the notion of things farther away appear smaller. And uh, with that, you, we see that morph into the uh, perspective system that artists use uh, by artists such as Brunelleschi. I'll show you some of that now. So here's, here's Fra Angelico, a very much a medieval artist, but a contemporary of, uh, actually he was a little bit later than Leonardo, uh, and in which you can see that he still is medieval in that the figures are beautiful calligraphic uh, two-dimensional uh, 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 essays on, on using drapery uh, to create these incredibly beautiful shapes that you can see in the skirts and in the, uh, in the uh, wings and in the, uh, in the apertures between the columns, each one a little picture in its own right. Uh, so so Frangelico continues the, the pattern making of uh, shape uh, but on the other hand, he also demonstrates that he's a master of the new discovered perspective rules, which is in the colonnades on the left, or in the, uh, the notion of using a little doorway behind the Virgin Mary's figure. And then in that doorway is either a picture or a window, so, so large to small. So he combines both. I happen to th uh, have this uh, picture uh, permanently in my house because I find it, uh, I find myself endlessly looking at it with great wonder. Uh, the, the fence on the left, the lovely little ornamental uh, garden. Uh, uh, and when, when you really take it apart, it's all shapes, isn't it? There's no, 
it's just, it's all flat shapes. Uh, maybe the little bit of the uh, rendering of the columns is suggesting a uh, suggesting form. Uh, and then curiously, I found uh, look at the uh, black line that is on the top of the picture, uh, which is a which is a modern invention when uh, when the uh, uh, the uh, cement made in those days, which was not very technically very strong, uh, began to come apart. They would reinforce columns like running uh, iron rods through them to keep them all standing up. So uh, Fra Angelico uh, sought to include that, which I also found interesting. So this is an example of one who's, but on the one hand, he's still a child of the pattern making artist world of the pre perspective. And on the other hand, he's one of the first masters of perspective to appear in, the, in, in Italian art anyway. And this uh, is the, uh, this is a picture by Fra Angelic, or excuse me, Piero della Francesca, uh, who wrote uh, the first book on what, what perspective is and how it works that was shared all over the world. Um, and, uh, uh, and this picture, there, there's, there's maybe probably written about this, about this artist and particularly about this picture. And so why is that? So take a moment and just stay with this picture. How is this different from the Fra Angelico that we just looked at and from, uh, from, from these pictures? So from that to this. So first of all, he, he, uh, uh, he, uh, what what is the smallest figure in this in this uh, painting? Uh, a statue. Well, the statue, right? The statue, which is an Apollo. In other words, it's a reference to uh, to the classical world. But right under the statue is Jesus Christ. Jesus. Okay. And Jesus Christ, in terms of the standing figures, is the smallest. The patrons are the biggest figures. The three figures on the right. Uh, on the right side of the painting. So uh, he's, he's purposefully demonstrating that large and small has to do with space and has to do with perspective. And if you look at the roof on the left side, it's an example of two-point perspective. Uh, it's a, uh, 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 and if you look at the roof on the right, where there's a column uh, behind the, the right, the, the full, full figure on the right you can see that's a how he demonstrates the uh the eaves and the windows uh, are all uh, in in a, a forced perspective which is two point perspective which is which is uh, truncated to to be uh, to be close together uh, so he's demonstrating and then look at the pattern on the floor it's another example of perspective so this is a uh, encyclopedia a perspective and how it works. That is where figures are smaller according to space, where, where uh, the importance of the figure uh, is not necessarily have to do with their size and where perspective establishes the presence of a, of a larger space than the painting. So we no longer are looking at a pattern, although he gives us a pattern, we're also looking at a, a window into which we're looking into deep space. And so this was the beginning of the modern age of painting in the Western world. I want you to note that I keep saying the Western world because with the coming of a, uh, with the coming of a, a, a kind of a international uh, understanding that art is everywhere and art is made by all kinds of people, whether you're a New Guinea a boat maker or whether you're a, uh, a Chinese landscape painter, or whether you're a child drawing their mother for the first time, which is a circle with two eyes in it. Uh, uh, they're all systems of art. And the Western system of perspective, where the window is a win the, 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 the rectangular is a window, has been, uh, has been certified uh, and kept alive by the invention of photography. And photography is really only the system you're looking at right now uh, uh, reduced to a single lens reflex camera. <clears throat> and those of you who are photographers 
or if you have worked with photography a long time, know that the camera is not how things really look. The camera is an artifice. Uh, it does it does it distorts things very differently from the eye. For example, it pulls the uh, it pulls uh, the the perspective of, of edges out to the edge of the image. Uh, this is why uh, anybody who, of you who happens to have been a actress, a, a film actress, knows that uh, most film actresses have to weigh ten pounds less than the than how they're looked at on a film because the, the film widens the edges of all of its subjects so everything looks fat wider and or if you're a person fatter and so uh, uh that's why we have so many anorexic uh, actors actors and actresses is because of that uh, that phenomenon of, of artifice that's characteristic of photographs uh, so there's a lot there's a lot about photographs we get used to them and then we kind of artificially substitute the camera for reality but uh, if you start really looking at how you look, for example, when you're looking, you, you don't stay in one place at all the time. You, you look around, you, you collect a, a series of points of view in which you have a general aspect of, of, uh, of, of a subject from, uh, from, from several points of view. Uh, here's here's uh, Lorenzo Ghiberti, the great sculptor of the Renaissance. Uh, and this is one of his doors of paradise. Uh, that uh, it originally lived on the baptistry walls outside of the uh, the great Duomo in Florence, Italy, but the uh, corrosion because all the buses uh, uh, in the city uh, circle the baptistry on their way in and out of town, and the fumes of modern cars were destroying this uh, this uh, these wonderful uh, uh, bronze uh, panels. Uh, and by the way, I was living in Florence for. A couple of years in 1958, and uh, uh, and they were still they were still outside. Now they're inside, and they they they've got some uh, replicas outside. But you can see here the in the in the lower part, uh, things look closer to us, not just because the figures are bigger, but because they're more detached from their background. So they they live in the space that you and I live in to some extent. And then the the second generation of figures, the ones that are are in the middle of the painting are less are less detached from the background, so that they have the appearance of being farther away because we don't sense them as as very three dimensional. And then if you look at the uh, architecture of the church like uh, background behind the figures, it's very shallow, although it's representing deep space. So Ghiberti took the same principle of the single lens reflex. Uh, and uh, and uh, demonstrated how it works in sculpture. Andy, I'm going to interrupt you up one moment, just yeah. because um, it is almost noon right now, and I know some of our people are going to have to go. So um, okay. even though we're recording this, so I was just wondering uh, if anybody would like to unmute themselves now or have any questions or comments. Um, Okay. Uh, I do that smart... all the time. Bobby, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. No, sure. Are there any questions for me right now? Or, or comments? I, I can speed um, up too. Uh, okay. Um, Diana, uh, Diana is saying thank you, Andy, for the terrific insight and information. Um, so, um, yeah. Okay. Well, um, I would just say keep on going. And okay. I know you all, I'm, I'm I know you also want to. Little... Tell us about the Oracle uh, art tour coming up in November too, okay, correct? Yeah, I'll mention that, right. Yeah, so, okay. So here, here's an etching of mine uh, done from uh, Guanajuato, Mexico, in which the, the, the entire town is built on hillsides. And I, I, I have it up here as an example of, I'm aware of the pattern that I'm making, uh, uh, just like Picasso, in which I got a dark column on the left, a light column in the middle, a dark column on the right, and then a light column on the outer edge, so that that the three columns gives this thing a two-dimensional pattern look. Although it is uh, uh, accurate uh, two-point perspective, and the, and then of course it has a narrative of a very beautiful city uh, with incredible buildings on these hillsides. Or here is a a, a broadside, uh, something I did with a, my poet friend Drum Hadley, who was a rancher, and he's now passed away, in which I 
every every couple of years we took a poem of his and then I would give it a, a print in which we could make make 50 of them and sell them or give them to friends uh, in which I use the uh, the uh, uh, images inspired by the uh, cave paintings of 30,000 years ago, along with uh, very uh, accurate portraits of his grandchildren, along with uh, a flat surface of the poem. So I'm combining both ancient flat uh, per uh, uh, perspective with, uh, with a modern narrative story and then, and then modern drawing in, th in three dimensional form. So you can combine things. That's what I want to make an emphasis. Your, your, your ability to combine limbic uh, uh, narrative and, uh, and uh, flat pattern reptilian uh, shape and pattern uh, are all available all the time. Uh, now this gets into the limbic scene. What characterizes limbic scene is, uh, is light, uh, intimacy, a kind of stage-like presentation. This could be a tableau in the old days, you know, when you had one uh, 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 different actors all just standing still and the curtain would open and you would study the, the uh, still poses they were in and then the curtain would close. But these were, this was, that was a style of theater many years ago. Uh, limbic also is a, has a sensuality of color and it's also suggestive of, of all kinds of physical sensation, such as the nudity of the Christ body, uh, such as the uh, black light, dark light, dark light uh, pattern as you move from the, uh, uh, the, the upper area of, of several figures to the lower area of the uh, drapery surrounding Christ's body to the platform on which figures stand. It's a very carefully composed composition. And of course, it's a very big story. And then it's, it's illuminated like much of the, uh, much of the art of the, uh, of the uh, Baroque period uh, following the uh, Renaissance in Europe. Or here's uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, a cartoon for a tapestry. I don't know if the tapestry was ever made. But I call it limbic because, as you can see, everything's out of focus. He, he didn't make the lines on the edge of the figures uh, too, too sharp. Uh, and, then, and then it's a study in ovals, not unlike Picasso's uh, 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 mirror figure that I showed you earlier. Can you see the knees as you go across from the knees yeah. of the Persian or, or the breasts or the faces? It's an exercise in softness and soft rendering. And, uh, and to that extent, it, it, it's very limbic and feeling and intimate uh, uh, in addition to the narrative, in addition to the, uh, to the very uh, elegant triangular composition. Or even in sculpture, in Michelangelo's David, uh, if you notice, if you start with the left hand and imagine, you know, if you and I were walking around this figure, we would be about it, our eye would be about knee height. A little, a little below the knee, uh, and that we are drawn to start on the on the right side of the figure, our left side, and, and as you can see, the, everything kind of turns slowly like a barber pole. So we we can feel the head turning to the left, the arm to the left, the the left knee uh, thrust forward, the right leg uh, is the is the solid uh, foundation on which the uh, the figure turns gently and slightly. From, from left to right. So that, that's the limbic aspect of it. The other limbic aspect of the sculpture is that uh, uh, marble is as close to uh, the smoothness of skin as you can get in a hard medium. And so there's a, there's a sensuality to the marble uh, polishing, the, both the forming and the, and the marble shape that is very, uh, very essential, especially when you see it in the scale that it is. Or uh, in the very famous uh, picture of Vermeer of the girl with the golden earring, uh, you can look at how, it, we're, we're, look at her shoulder and look at how the, the, the picture is divided, uh, dark on the left, light on the right. And then with a light object in the dark, which is the scarf hanging down. Uh, and then the beautiful, brilliant light of the face uh, against the, uh, uh, the black right side. And then the, again, the turning, the barber pole turning of it so that uh, we have the uh, shoulder we're looking at di directly. And then 
as you move, as the eye takes you up the scarf to the head, the head is, 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 uh, is turning gently to the right. And then uh, the eyes turn even more to the right uh, so that they're looking directly at us as the observer. It's a marvelous composition, Ele elegant in its simplicity and elegant in its, uh, in its emotional uh, intimate contact uh, with, the, with the model. Uh, and elegant in the uh, in the dark light pattern, uh, uh, you know. So on every level, it's deeply satisfying to me as a, as an image that uses both light, color, pattern, in uh, and 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 limbic uh, feeling in very very uh, 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 organized way. Or Renoir, who who is, uh, I saw a movie of his. He he made a movie. In which he said, "Well, uh, he loved he loved young women, sunlight and the spring, and that he he never could understand why artists would paint anything other than what they loved. So it's soft like Leonardo's uh, tapestry drawing. Uh, it's gentle in its colors, like everything is on the light side: yellows, soft grays, soft greens, uh, soft flesh tones. Uh, were placed about." Four to six feet away from the model, so we're we're intimately close to the figure. Uh, all of the things Renoir absolutely did on purpose to increase the limbic contact as well as uh, the gentleness of the uh, out of focus uh, nature of the uh, form and color. So this is a very limbic picture. And then finally, uh, I, I won't go through all of these, uh, but I, I had a whole series in this. Uh, in this, if ever you want to see this again, in which I, uh, I, I invite people to emphasize how much is this picture reptilian, how much is cortical, and how much is limbic. So on the left, I gave my, my own uh, emphasis that it's reptilian in the uh, abstractness of the shapes. It's cortical in the uh, sense of a moving figure. It's definitely a figure, and it's definitely uh, uh, deals with the cubist movement. And it's limbic, of course, in its in both its color and its uh, its uh, feeling for its feeling for a, a, a vocabulary of shapes that are endlessly interesting to look at. Or here is a, a a large etching I did of my wife Anne, in which I basically am qu quite aware of creating a a dark column, then a light zone, and then a dark figure in front of the light zone. And then a right dark column with some pattern on it. So I'm I'm well aware of uh, creating a pattern in addition to a limbic uh, 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 nude uh, body, in addition to light uh, by emphasizing the shadows on the so-called floor, uh, and in addition to a few elements to uh, narrate desert, uh, so that uh, I create an inside and an outside, a pattern to look at, a limbic figure, uh, and so forth. So I'm I'm a well aware like like I've uh, been talking about here uh, that I'm using all the levels of seeings in a single image. Or here's a here's a uh, uh, the what is his name it just slipped my mind the uh, the French uh, Gauguin. Pardon. No, Gauguin. This, no, this this is not Gauguin. This is a, Rousseau. Uh, Rousseau. Okay, yeah, Henri Rousseau. Thank you. <laughs> My 90 year old brain does this to me now every now and then. And in it, you can look that if you squint at it, squint at it, will you? And if you squint at it, you see that the white flowers are very prominent, are they not? And then the, uh, the foreground, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the green and yellow uh, barbed uh, bushes on the, along the front, uh, the uh, single uh, nude female is, uh, is uh, silhouetted against a dark a couch of some sort. Uh, uh, the, the, there are, uh, there are uh, other fruit and other creatures in the middle. So he's very well aware of, he's giving us a huge vocabulary of jungle and desert and jungle animals. We see a lion uh, in the middle. So uh, 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 he gives us a fantasy jungle uh, along with a, uh, a, a very odd seated nude. What, what is she doing there anyway? There's a good question for you. 
And then, and then the beauty of the flowers and the fauna, which is a, what most of the picture is about. Or here, if, if I go, take you back to the, uh, to the example of the uh, silversmith print of the profile, here is the, uh, the, the uh, wife of the Duke of Urbino, uh, which, and, and this is basically what portraiture did in his time, which it was basically a statement of his wealth. This is uh, in, in which the wife is property uh, and she's dressed in the ornaments that he bought for her. Uh, and they are, uh, uh, they are, you know, in the jewelry, in the uh, very wealthy uh, clothing and fabric and tapestry, in the, in the fantastic hairdo, and then uh, posed like a Roman emperor in profile in front of a piece of land that's to demonstrate all the land that the Duke of Urbino owns. So this is a property like, and this is how, by the way, how, how personal portraiture snuck into the art world after years and years of uh, religious art and other, other philosophic art uh, as, a, as a symbol of wealth uh, and uh, uh, became, became a, a very, it's still an important part of the much of so-called Western painting. Beautiful picture though. And then at some point we see, uh, this is Kandinsky, the Russian master of non-objective art in which the, uh, the what is limbic about this is the color and the playfulness. What's, what's uh, uh, reptilian about it is uh, re uh, reducing the thing to shapes which have no meaning other than their presence with each other. Uh, and what's narrative about it is uh, basically uh, leaving us to make, up, to make up anything we want to about what it is. There's no, no narrative particularly that we're dealing with anymore. And that was a big break uh, in, in Western art from. Uh, when everything ha had to have a story or a narrative and to where it doesn't have to have it necessarily. Or here is, I just saw, by the way, if any of you get to San Francisco in the next uh, couple of months, there's a great show of uh, the uh, American abstract expressionist painter named Joan Mitchell, whose work I absolutely adore. This is 12 feet long by 10 feet high. Uh, she paints with an aggressive anger and, and, and plastic uh, attack of the canvas in ways that I can't get enough of. So there's 80 paintings of hers in a show at the San Francisco Modern Art Museum right now, along with the uh, Diego Rivera mural that's been taken out of storage and mounted for two years. So if you can get yourself to San Francisco, now's the time to go. There's also a show at the De Young Museum of the, of the lifelong work of Judy Chicago. And uh, I had never seen anything other than her uh, family dinner table. And I'll tell you, uh, I think every woman who's alive today would do well to get to know uh, Judy Chicago's work. And by the way, they produce an extraordinary catalog uh, uh, at the De Young, and you can just you can get online and buy it. And I recommend it. It's a book that you really ought to be in your library, especially if you're a woman artist, because she she takes on the issue of, because she, she only works in crochet, knitting, uh, but, but eight, 10 feet big, working with friends. Uh, she's, it's amazing. She's an amazing woman and has a lot to say that we men should listen to very carefully. <laughs> Here's a, 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 a watercolor of mine uh, done in Italy. Uh, just an example that although it's a, it's so-called realistic in the in the narrative sense that is you know what it is and it's in the tradition of a Western watercolor painting. I'm quite clear that as an abstraction, uh, that I'm I, uh, the uh, the uh, the arc of the buildings in the upper part uh, it separates the far view in the upper right hand corner, uh, separated by an unpainted area of the middle and lower part, uh, which provide a. Uh, background for the trees and bush study. So I'm aware that I'm, a, I'm working with traditional subject, but I'm working with it in a more abstract way. Here's Monet's uh, Lazar station. Nobody ever until uh, 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 Manet, excuse me, not, or Monet uh, uh, ever painted train stations. The idea of painting a train station would be like the idea of going down and painting a Caterpillar tractor. 
<laughs> it's like who would do it unless they've got some really weird idea. So that was a new, the, the industrial world was coming, was taking away much of Paris landscape. And uh, it was, a, it was a destroying much of what was beautiful about Paris to make room for the new industrial factories and trains and buses and uh, automobile, so forth. And uh, so it had a lot of level of meanings. And so uh, uh, Monet gave it, gave it a, 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 it was a kind of a joke that he would use something like a train station to make such a beautiful picture as this. Uh, here's a etching I did in Mexico, sitting in a cafe uh, in which uh, the pictures on the wall, the doorways, the panels on the doorways and so forth, they're all kind of, uh, again, uh, uh, studies in perspective, but on the other hand, a very abstract use of line. Here's Van Gogh's uh, uh, bedroom uh, when he was living uh, uh, with Gauguin. And as you can tell, he tilted the room up in order to show the chairs from a, as if he were standing up looking down at them. Uh, however, the pictures on the wall are looking straight at them, uh, the uh, window in the back. So he combines uh, different ways of being to show you uh, his room. And in many ways, it, it's more accurate to how we really see than the photograph. So this, this could not be a photograph, but it is, I, I, I think you'll agree, a very comfortable example of how we mostly see life as say, like you walk through your own house. This is how we see as we walk through our own house. And then uh, this painting by uh, Francois Millet, and it's drawing rather, I'll I'm gonna show you the painting in the middle. Uh, he was almost jailed for making this painting. The uh, forces in uh, Paris were, were taking away uh, all of the uh, land, as I mentioned, talking about Manet's train station uh, uh, that had been uh, country, uh, uh, kind of country farmland that was, it wasn't owned by the peasants, but historically it had been farmed by them for hundreds of years. And now the city was uh, com commandeering this land for new factory buildings. And so he painted this as an objection, paintings he painted an objection. One of the things that they couldn't abide in the uh, French corporate world was that he painted them like they were Michelangelo figures. The idea of making peasants look like the monumental figures of Michelangelo was considered to be a blasphemy. And so uh, 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 his friend Daumier, uh, basically, here was, the, here was the painting he made out of that, uh, basically had to spirit him away to the south of France and hide him out because he was sentenced to uh, six months in prison for making these paintings. Can you imagine being sent to prison for making these wow. paintings? Wow. <laughs> so there's a story by that. And, uh, huh. Okay, so that's kind of my, my uh, discussion. I hope any of that was useful and I'm certainly open to questions. Oh, I'm, uh, one of the things that I forgot that Bobby mentioned, I'm opening a show of my new work using the Sonoran grasses of my desert. Uh, Fox McGrew, uh, our, our, our uh, a ceramic sculptor who lives out here at Rancho Linda Vista with me for, for 52 years now, uh, uh, and I are having a show in our gallery opening November 1st, and, and it's open through tw November 27th. Uh, there's an Oracle art tour on, on the weekend of November 6th and 7th. And we're gonna, we've put our opening on that day, but you're welcome to come out anytime. Um, uh, I'll, give, I'll give Bobby my phone number and my email. So you can, if you wanna come out and know that when I'm here, I'll be happy to, to correspond with you anytime. Uh, so, uh, 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 and then there's a, uh, I'll give, uh, if I still don't have it, I'll give Bobby uh, the invitation that she can post on your website so that you have that. To, to uh, guide you. There's a map on that one too as well. Okay. Uh, Andy, that would be great. Um, we have some wonderful comments um, from many people just loving your presentation. Um, and I can send those to you. And I thought it was just excellent, uh, your presentation. And I learned so much. Um, thank you. Um, I'll look at things differently after, you know. Um, so I'm going to open it up. Does anybody have any questions? They could unmute themselves and um, we could just chat a minute. If you've ever been up 
to the um, ranch, it is wonderful to go see Andy's, well, yeah, your work and uh, everything up there. So I encourage everybody to go up. By the way, uh, as far as time, uh, the way you can calculate how long it gets, it takes to get here is that from, from Ina Road and Oracle Road, which is on the north end of our Tucson, it's 35 minute drive. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll have the, post the map when I post my invitation with the, on, on your website. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Andy? And yeah. Um, I had a question about the collaborative work you did with the poet uh -huh. and, yeah. and the red part of that image. That's a print, right? Yes, yes. The, the, one, with the, the one with the, yeah, that's a print. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how did you do that? Is it like a sugar lift or some kind of? Uh, it's a, it's well, it's it's a uh, soft ground process. I call soft ground. In yeah, which I, I mix a lot of wax in in the uh, acid resistant asphalt and then coat the plate with that. And then when I press uh, when I press any kind of fabric uh, 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 and and pass it through the press with a piece of mat board on it, it imprints the uh, the texture of the fabric into the wax that's on the paper. And when that pulls up, when you bite that, it gives you a replica of that fabric. So I use hundreds of fabrics and I, and I can come, I, can, I, 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 I shellac out the part I don't want to have the acid bite. Yeah. But it's basically a form of drawing and it's very sure. natural for me right now. Yeah. I'm, so in, in fact, if ever you're interested in that, uh, a couple of times a year, I offer an introduction course to the nature of etching. I'm doing one right now that's four weeks. And then we have a Friday group that anybody who's just working in uh, printmaking comes in Fridays. And I have two teachers who work with me. Uh, and you can come anytime you want once you, once you learn the basics. Uh, I am a printmaker. So um, I know a lot about, I, I don't know which acid you're using, but um, yeah, I'd love that. Is it in Tucson or at Loma Linda? Yeah. No, that's it. every Friday uh, from from uh, nine to two in the morning. We, we have a we have a small print room in there, and uh, Tom Lindell and uh, Jennifer Clark, who's a great uh, Danish artist who lives in Tuvac, all help me teach that course. So you're with great people, and it's very informal. And so we invite people to come, and you can always come. Uh, we only charge by the day. So if you come, if if you take a five a five uh, attendant. Uh, uh, it's a hundred. It's a hundred dollars, and if you come uh, one day at a time, it's twenty-five dollars for the day. And you're welcome. Thank you. To come on, on any basis, it works for you. That's wonderful. Good. Anybody? By the way, if, you're, if you're not on our mailing list, I advise you to call the drawing studio. Get on our website. Find find the information. Call the drawing studio and get on our mailing list. Doesn't cost you anything. And that way you get all the programs. And we got a lot of programs right now. They're, they're, we got a lot of one dayers. We got a lot of, we, our, our fundamentals program is six weeks long, six, six one day a week. And we have a lot of them. So people who work at night, people who can only drive by day. So there's, a, there's always a way to find some place for yourself. So we have two programs that are just for beginners who need to learn to draw in a serious way. And they are each six weeks long with homework. And then we have a series of courses that we call Drawing Fundamentals 3, that if you want to focus just on charcoal or just on pen and ink or just on the composition, we have many different subjects that flow through uh, every year and, and change all the time. Andy, yeah. I have a question. You're, you're painting on tile. Mm -hmm. um, I, I love looking at the repetition of the rectangles all throughout this. And I'm wondering, did you initially decide to do that on tile or was that an afterthought? No, I, uh, uh, it was kind of interesting. In the 80s, the bottom fell out of the black and white printmakers market, which had supported me and got my kids through college because I had stopped teaching in those days. And uh, so I had got, I had several galleries around the, around the world actually. And so I, uh, but there was a point when, uh, when uh, the, the interest passed on to large color prints made by semi-commercial uh, new kind of uh, uh, printmaking studios that, that printed for artists and artists stopped printing for themselves. 
So there was a drop off in the interest in black and white American printmaking. It's, it's coming back now, but it was gone for a while. And so I happened to have been making tile for my own bathroom. And a friend of mine said, would you make one for me? And suddenly I was in a new business. And so, and, and actually uh, those of you who, who are ceramists yourself uh, and have made prints, you know that it's a lot the same. Uh, in other words, when you're making a tile, you're, you're working with glazes that are not the color that they fire at. So you have to work indirectly. Uh, and uh, so I, I, uh, I learned a lot. I also learned a lot from my compadre out here, Fox McGrew, who, cause I never studied ceramics in my life. So, uh, so I began to make tile, then I began to make fireplaces and, and, uh, and uh, uh, entrance, entrances to houses and bathrooms and kitchens. And so it, it kept me going for about 10 years. That's how I got into it. And, and thank you. I love the, um, the dark light patterns of your Wanawato piece. It's fabulous. Oh, 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 thank you so much. Thank you very much. Good. Well, you're invited always to come out and visit me anytime. I'm, I'm a, I, I turned 90 last, last month. So I'm uh, at the point where I don't, I don't drive well anymore, uh, but my brain still seems to be there and I still love making art and I still love my art friends. So, but I just don't travel as much. <laughs> So well, but I'm, always you, welcome, I'm, always, I'm always welcome anybody who'd like to come out and visit and see work or just take a walk and talk a little bit. If you would post your contact information or phone number, we can schedule that. Okay. Andy, um, this is Gennardi here. And I just wanted to tell you, this was one of the best, most informative talks I've ever heard. I really appreciate it a lot. And um, a testament is that foundations of art, testament to the drawing studio is the foundations of art class is the best art class that I've ever experienced. And I tell everybody who says they can only draw stick figures, go to this class. Oh, thank so you, thank, thank you. you. Well, from your mouth to God's ears, I love it. You know, <laughs> we're, we're, we're growing massively right now and we're trying to buy the, there's a Circle K behind us that's up for sale and we, they, they haven't found any buyers. And so we would like to buy it, but, but we, we don't have the money to quite do it. We have a little bit, uh, but, but we have to act on it pretty quick. So I'm in a, a, a emergency process to find $300,000. I've got about half of it raised among our friends. So I just want to put the word out there. Anybody you know, uh, we're, we're, we're naming sections of our, of our new, uh, and we're expanding, we have a whole acre and we're putting programs into all the neighborhoods, uh, one dayers that are free to start trying to interest people who would never study art otherwise. Uh, and I've got the best staff I ever had. M. Brought is, a, is, a, is our new executive director and she is a saint of a woman. Uh, I have a, a, a staff of six who are just, I mean, it's, it's an exciting time for us, but we're really struggling to, to grow quickly because we need to. So, uh, Any anything else? I really Any... liked the, the three scenes and, and the premise behind them. The only thing I might say is that in the pattern recognition, I think a little bit more important than that is edge detection. Because if you can't okay. see an edge, you can't see a pattern. Uh -huh. Edge um, detection. Yes. Because a, a predator will hide um, based on pattern, so you can't see their silhouette. Um, but if you can see the edge of the uh, yeah. predator, uh -huh. um, flight is more possible. Uh -huh. Well, that's, you know, the thing about uh, pattern requires, it, it, pattern works within a, within a context. Uh, 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 the uh, great uh, abstract expressionist uh, teacher, Hans Hoffman, uh, who's one of my one of my inspirations in life, said the first line that you make on your artwork is not the first; it's the fifth, because you're working the the, the four edges are the, are the first four, and so anything you do within those four edges has to take those edges into account because that's how a pattern is made, isn't it? Like if you have a rectangle and you draw one line from top to bottom, you now have two shapes inside that rectangle. If you draw two lines, you now have four shapes and so forth. 
So you need to be aware that you're working with a conventional system. And that's the other part about making art. You got to understand you're, you're, you're a part of a long, long history. Uh, and if you don't learn the conventions of the history out of which you work, uh, you're working at a great disadvantage to yourself. This is why I find, uh, I find uh, 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 very often in, in the students that I, I work with, uh, what's missing is a deeper understanding of art history. Not just Western art history either, but the art mm -hmm. history from, from, uh, from the, you know, when I was uh, in, in graduate school, I helped a, 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 one of the historians mount the first ever African sculpture show that was ever held in Western Museum in America because African art at that time was considered to be archeology. span It was not considered to be art. We call art what, what we know as art, what we know from picture making from the Western European world. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we slowly and gradually included a little bit of Chinese, but if you start really looking mm -hmm. at art uh, from in the world, then you see that it's, it's everywhere and it's not in the form you think. Most of it is not in museums. Uh, most of it is in life. Um, and so uh, to the extent that you begin to be aware of where art is that's not in museums, you, you work from a larger, richer vocabulary that, that, uh, that inspires your art and, and will often find ways that is more intimately closer to your personal nature than what you learn from being in a, in a, in a museum. So there, there's something, finding your personal art means you got to look much more broadly than just what we've called art up until now. I like that, your personal art. I like that idea. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yes. Anybody else? Well, Hi, Andy. Andy. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> go Hi. ahead. Hi, Andy. This is Diana Davis. And Hi, Diana. I know, and I just wanted to tell you how much I have enjoyed um, being uh, a student and um, studying under you for many, many years since you first yeah. opened the art studio. And uh, I went and took a monoprinting class and um, discovered printmaking. Oh, good. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I, I haven't been uh, active in the drawing studio for a few years now, but um, I just... Uh, I think people should know when they have an impact on people's lives. And I have so thoroughly enjoyed working with you over the years and knowing you. Thank you. Well, I'm very glad to hear that and I appreciate knowing it. So, but you guys with the paperwork, I, I, again, as I began this talk, I, I just want to acknowledge you of uh, keeping your group together. And uh, you have a reputation of being an incredibly serious and exploratory group. Uh, uh, and I, uh, th that's, that's what I know about you. Thank you. We are, and we uh, share with each other and um, share the creativity, so, and explore together. Well, yeah. thank you, Andy. This has been a great talk. Um, I'm okay. glad you went over. There was so much information you had. And we will encourage all of our um, members uh, to come up on October, no, November 6th and 7th to Oracle. Uh -huh. Yeah, that'd be great for the art well, tour. I'd love to see you. And, and, and when you come, remind me of, uh, uh, that you were in, in this talk, will you? So I'd like to know okay. that when you, when you oh, That'd be great. Uh, so I'm gonna have, uh, my studio is in the lower part of the barn, Fox is in the upper part and the show is in the gallery. And so I'm gonna be sitting up by the gallery, but my granddaughter Ivy is gonna be minding my studio, which will be open as well. I'm showing, uh, I'm showing some of the new grasses pieces, which are, I'm very excited about what I'm doing. Uh, there, it's a totally new direction for me. Uh, so uh, uh, anyway, uh, when, when you come out, I'd love to talk to you about, about that. And, about, and also, if you can bring anything that, uh, that represents your work, would you bring it with you in a, in a, in, on your iPhone? Or if you have a couple little pieces you can carry, oh. I, would love, I would love to interact with you about what you do. Oh, nice. That, okay. That's a wonderful exchange. Good. Great. Well, All thank right. you, Andrew. Okay. And, um, been a great talk and great day. I'm glad you've talked over the time because we learned so much and it was wonderful to share. We will post this. This has been recorded. So we will post this um, on our YouTube channel pretty soon. It should be up there. 
fairly soon and uh, and I'll save the chat and we will uh, do that too. So everybody is saying thank you and thought you were wonderful. So <laughs> thank you guys. Love being okay. with you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Andrew. Bye-bye. <laughs>